and uh, I am the director of the collaborative specialization in public health policy at University of Toronto. And I run these rounds. Um, this is a special session of our public health policy rounds. These rounds happen monthly. If you're interested and you haven't been here before, then please uh, do sign up uh, with Sonia Johnson, who's on, who's on the call and Sonia uh, will or can put her email address into the, uh, the chat box. Speaking of the chat box, um, you're welcome to use it to comment as we go along, to ask questions here and there. Uh, when we get to the Q&A, uh, we will uh, ask you to unmute if you feel comfortable, if you prefer to post questions or comments in the chat, that's also fine. Uh, so um, these rounds serve also as uh, part of two classes uh, in the collaborative specialization in public health policy. And uh, because of that, we'd like to give our students uh, first dibs when it comes to Q&A. So when we get there, um, just hold off a little bit if you're not one of those. Um, and uh, as always, uh, my students, um, you are not only encouraged, but um, you're, um, harshly encouraged. How should I say? Strongly encouraged. We really would like you. Uh, to uh, show uh, your stuff and to speak up and to um, uh, query our speakers uh, about public health policy processes and um, you know use some of the frameworks that we that we learn in order to uh, pose questions about the content we're hearing today. Um, so I don't want to take up much room. Um, as always, uh, we're going to acknowledge the land on which we sit. And I know that not everybody is sitting on the lands of the, that on which the University of Toronto sits. Indeed, I'm not doing that today. Although on Wednesdays, you will find me in my office. Um, and um, I hope to see some other people in that building because it's been really empty um, on Wednesdays when I'm there. Um, in any case, uh, I'm in Toronto and I, I'm thinking about the lands on which I sit now and their uh, original settlers. Um, uh, and I'm also thinking about other lands that I've lived on and how I've been a settler in other lands. Um, and I encourage you to think about those things uh, as uh, you wish, um, as I'm reading out the acknowledgement for the lands on which the University of Toronto sits. So we do wish to acknowledge the land on which U of T operates. For thousands of years, this has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And I'm grateful also today to uh, Daniel Eisencraft Klein and his colleagues uh, in this special initiative. They asked to use this session of the public health policy rounds uh, for it. And I quickly agreed because I know it's really important and interesting stuff. Yes, I'll use that word stuff um, uh, um, if, if for public health policy students. And it's an angle that we don't often address. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Daniel to introduce um, his program um, and then to introduce the speakers. Thanks so much. So great to be here, everyone. Uh, this is a collaboration of a former collaborative specialization I was part of, the, uh, the public health policy specialization, and then this series that I'm working on with uh, Dr. Quinn Grundy and Dr. Erica DiRuggiero. So uh, it's a great crossover for me. And as someone who really believes in good public health policy and addressing the commercial determinants of health. It's very exciting to have these uh, intersect. Um, so for those who are new here, uh, this is a series co-hosted by the Center for Global Health, Dalana School of Public Health, and the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. Um, the title of the series is Health Inc. Corporations, Capitalism, and the Commercial Determinants of Health. Um, participants who do attend all seminars receive a, a certificate of completion at the end. The objective of this series has been to create a forum to promote conversations, research training, collaboration across sectors and disciplines regarding the impacts of corporations on health. Um, we're exploring a lot of themes, including industry's role in harm reduction, public-private partnerships, uh, health data, data justice, and the role of corporations in the climate crisis and inequities. 
Uh, in terms of housekeeping, as Rob mentioned, we'll try to address as many questions as possible. Um, and we are gonna try to give it to the uh, Collaborative Specialization Fellows first to put those questions forward. You can do so in the chat. You can also uh, message directly. So today we're talking about um, overlap of industries. Uh, we have two terrific speakers. I'm very excited for this in particular because uh, as we talked about before, the commercial terms of health, a lot of the strength of it is getting ahead of uh, the next health harming industry and thinking about uh, how we can understand one industry strategies to um, sort of foresee some of the, some of the other uh, issues that come up from other industries. So um, with that said, uh, Benoit Gomi is a lecturer at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and a research fellow with the Pandemics and Borders Project at Simon Fraser University. Uh, his research focuses on the illicit trade in drugs, in particular, the role of the industry in shaping responses to it, as well as terrorism and borders. And he's speaking today about overlaps between the tobacco and cannabis industries. Dr. Joanna Lima Madureira is a health policy advisor at the World Health Organization in Kyrgyzstan. Um, Joanna trained as a medical doctor, after which she pursued a master's in global health, and then she decided to pursue a PhD in this area, and uh, in 2019 defended her thesis, The Commercial Determinants of Health, a Theoretical Framework and Empirical Application at uh, Oxford University. Uh, she's discussing a framework to systematically study corporations and other commercial interests as distal, structural, and societal factors that cause disease and, inju and injury, offering a systematic approach to mapping corporate activity. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to give it over first to Benoit. Um, he, Benoit, I believe you can share your slides. Let us know if you can't, and uh, you can take it away. All right. <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you to to Daniel and uh, and Rob first of all for the invitation. Thank you for putting together such a an interesting series. Um, I'm also grateful to all of you for for being here. I really look forward to uh, to the Q and A. I saw some familiar faces in the crowd, so I really look forward to that. Um, so first of all, you're probably wondering. Why, why are we talking about illicit trade today? This is not a law enforcement conference. This is not a, something organized by the criminology department. You're probably familiar with Rob's uh, pioneering work on the illicit tobacco trade. So I think you know where I'm going with this. But I, I'm here to argue that the illicit trade in legal drugs is a quintessentially public health issue, and public health uh, challenge. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about the case studies of of tobacco and then uh, cannabis in Canada for the for the past uh, three uh, and a half years or so being a legalized substance as well. Um, you know to show you that major major corporations uh, in both the tobacco and the uh, cannabis industry have been using the illicit the illicit trade as a way to uh, undermine uh, public health. Or at least we've definitely seen that in tobacco, and we've seen you know, anecdotal evidence that this might be happening with cannabis as well. So probably seen this picture before is from a, a congressional hearing in the US in the mid 90s where all uh, CEOs of uh, uh, the major uh, tobacco companies uh, swore that uh, and, um, and claimed that nicotine was not an addictive pr product. Uh, but in the, the, the mid 1990s and the early uh, 2000s, also when uh, we found out that uh, big tobacco companies like British American Tobacco or Philip Morris International uh, had been um, relying on the illicit tobacco trade, had been smuggling their own products uh, since at least the 1960s onwards. So why would they do that? Well, there's, uh, there's a number of reasons for it. Uh, number one, well, to increase profit and 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 uh, and market share. You know, uh, back in uh, the late fifties, the early nineteen sixties is when we started to get some some academic reports, some official government report on the severe health harms of uh, of cigarettes. Right, we had the U.S. Uh, uh, Surgeon General report in uh, around that time, and that's sort of when uh, those. Uh, major tobacco companies started to anticipate a sort of decline in smoking in the US. So they thought, okay, we need to 
find a way to, to, to expand our horizon, to enter new markets. A lot of these markets were actually uh, protected by uh, uh, trade barriers, by other protectionist measures, and the illicit trade, smuggling their own products, uh, was seen as a way to penetrate those markets, right? So for example, uh, in Paraguay, uh, uh, um, a, a country that, that colleagues and I have, have uh, uh, written on in, in the past few years, happy to share that link, a link later on. Uh, what British American Tobacco and, and PMI basically did was uh, legally exporting uh, a lot of cigarettes, billions of cigarettes uh, from the US to Paraguay and then used Paraguay, uh, which had a very small um, and still has a very small uh, domestic market as a smuggling hub, as a hub uh, to then smuggle these cigarettes to the much larger markets of Argentina and Brazil. Uh, while in the meantime, a lobbying government pressuring the government to say, hey, look, your populations love our products so much they're actually willing to import them and buy them legally. So let us in, let us establish ourselves uh, so we can both uh, uh, tackle this issue of the illicit, the illicit trade, but also so you can get some, some government uh, revenue. So that was very uh, effective. Uh, it also can be a way uh, to uh, to grow market share once you're established. Something that that was very visible in the, the you know tens of or hundreds of thousands of internal tobacco industry uh, uh, documents on this topic. For example, there was an interesting one uh, from 2005 as BAT directors were preparing uh, for a, a UK Parliament inquiry. Their own lawyers said. Um, that the evidence showed in the internal documents uh, clearly demonstrated that DNP channels or a duty not paid, which is an industry euphemism for smuggling, uh, those channels were being used to grow its, well, so the company's uh, market share. Um, it, you know, um, smuggling their own products is also a way to. Uh, lobby governments to lower uh, taxes on cigarettes and therefore to uh, increase uh, their uh, legal sales. So there's something that we've seen, we saw in Canada in the 1990s, something that Rob, Rob and other colleagues have, have documented uh, at length. But basically what happened is that in, in the early 1990s, big tobacco companies uh, in Canada basically legally uh, exported a lot of products, a lot of cigarettes, to the US for these products to then be smuggled back through First Nations Reserve to Canada, all the while lobbying the federal government to, to decrease uh, taxes on cigarettes. It was effective from their perspective, not from a public health perspective, because uh, when the federal government decided to lower uh, taxes on cigarettes in an effort to tackle this, this, uh, this illicit trade, this led to tens of thousands of additional uh, smoking rate to death in the next few years until that whole uh, scheme was uncovered. You know, other uh, reasons include the fact that, well, tobacco companies are paid regardless of whether uh, uh, their products end up being smuggled or not. As soon as cigarettes leave the factory and, and get to the wholesale distributor level, that's when they get their money, right? So then they claim, oh, well, what happens afterward is not uh, our uh, uh, responsibility. Other internal documents have shown arguments like, well, everyone else does it, you know, uh, smuggled cigarettes, and I quote, are a fact of life and almost institutionalized. That was, that was in Argentina and something that we've heard multiple senior tobacco executives over the years uh, um, uh, claim, right? It's also a, a low risk and high reward uh, sort of mechanism. It's, it's also, um, something uh, for which prices tend to be lower, uh, then it, it leads to greater sales, it leads to uh, more, you know, often younger con consumers becoming, you know, um, addicted to, to, the, to the drug. Uh, and of course, it's something that's easy to conceal within the massive uh, uh, trade uh, flows. And perhaps uh, uh, finally, controlling your entire supply chain is something that is quite inconvenient and quite uh, pricey for these companies. So a note on methods, how have they uh, uh, done so? How have they uh, smuggled on products? And whenever, remember the first time covering that in my uh, uh, Masters of Global Affairs course at the Monk School uh, on the illicit trade uh, in, in drugs, 
uh, one student raised the hand and was like, wait, hold on, is this a, a capstone seminar on how to smuggle cigarettes? Like, no, we're, we're, we're on the other side. I do not want you to become a smuggler. Uh, but basically, big tobacco companies have oversupplied uh, markets. So by overproducing in the markets uh, in, in sort of amounts that are not commensurate to uh, uh, local demand or the legal uh, the level of legal uh, legal exports, something that we've seen with British American tobacco recently, um, uh, oversupplying the the markets of um, Belgium and 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 uh, Luxembourg in, in particular, for those uh, then to be uh, smuggled back uh, to the UK as well as other European countries. There's also a, a lawsuit uh, uh, happening or that was filed a few months ago. Uh, in New York uh, by uh, Raul Setruk, who, who used to work as a consultant for Philip Morris International in uh, North Africa, and who claims um, that uh, PMI overproduced cigarettes in Algeria, in their main factory there, uh, and a lot of those products end up being smuggled across Europe, especially in France, where Marlboro cigarettes are the number one brand on the illegal market. Uh, we've seen other techniques like smuggling through transit hubs or smuggling hub, uh, hubs, uh, like in the case of, of Paraguay, or in the case of other more formal free trade zones, uh, with, of course, by nature, uh, low levels of, of regulation. We've seen uh, round tripping, uh, which is basically when country A exports uh, cigarettes to country B for these um, uh, cigarettes does just be smuggled back to country A, of course, to, to evade taxes and other regulations. Uh, we've seen uh, British American Tobacco and other companies relying on uh, distributors or uh, intermediaries that were well known to be uh, involved in smuggling and, and trafficking in order to keep a distance between, uh, between themselves and the illicit trade to provide that sort of buffer, something that continues to happen uh, uh, today, according to, to internal tobacco uh, industry documents, uh, we've seen them uh, divert duty-free uh, products to uh, other uh, destinations. Uh, we've seen them uh, carefully select markets with low levels of enforcement, with weak institutions, uh, with a lack of political will or, to address the issue, with political instability, uh, conflict zones, and so on and so forth. Uh, while also relying on complex sort of trade routes to, to evade law enforcement attention on this. Um, so, uh, so what, you know, <laughs> what are the consequences of, of illicit tobacco trade? Well, first of all, uh, those uh, products, those smuggled products, smuggled cigarettes tend to be cheap, cheaper, uh, which means more consumption, and more related morbidity and mortality, uh, higher uh, public health costs, uh, also lower uh, sort of tax uh, revenue for, for government and therefore less capacity, which explains why uh, countries with higher taxation levels uh, on tobacco products actually tend to have lower levels of illicit trade, according to WHO and other uh, peer-reviewed academic papers, um, something that goes against uh, the, the uh, tobacco industry narrative that we need to, to cut uh, taxes in order to tackle the illicit trade. Uh, this is, of course, something that also undermines the rule of law in a country that, that fuels and funds organized crime and money laundering. Um, as I explained with the case of Canada, governments may decrease taxes as a result or uh, remove uh, other tobacco control uh, measures that are effective at, at uh, uh, reducing uh, smoking prevalence. And it's also an opportunity for, for others to get involved, something that we looked at with colleagues uh, at SFU, including Professor Kelly Lee, in the case of Paraguay, where uh, BAT and PMI really set the stage, created a distribution network, creating the put together a playbook for other uh, smaller local companies to get involved. And Tabesa now is, is uh, Tabacalera del Este, is one of the largest uh, companies period in, in, in uh, a country um, and one that's been heavily involved in smuggling. Uh, but perhaps even more importantly, um, 
the illicit tobacco trade has paradoxically served as, as an opportunity for the tobacco industry to get involved in, in the government customs and law enforcement response, which they have been using as well an opportunity uh, for more revenue and, and, and profits so for, for commercial objectives, uh, but also has a, a sort of backdoor for influence on policy makings on tobacco control and public health measures. So in other ways, it really it's really helped them cement their power. And I really like this quote from, from Professor Anna Gilmore, uh, with, uh, whom I've had the, the pleasure to work with at the University of Bath, who, uh, with other authors uh, in 2015, talked about how talked about this sort of PR shift, right, uh, for tobacco companies now rebranding themselves. Uh, so from the perpetrators, from the peria of, of illicit uh, product to the victim and solution to the problem. Um, so, you know, how, how have they done so? How have they been able to, to become partners? So what kind of support are they providing to, to law enforcement and customs agencies? Well, they've been supporting uh, those authorities in, in a myriad of ways, including providing equipment, providing financial support, uh, information and intelligence, uh, training on how to detect illicit trade, directly advising law enforcement uh, on specific routes, specific strategies. Uh, so this is, for example, uh, an example of, um, um, of PMI being awarded this, this US uh, Department of Homeland Security Award uh, on illicit trade in part because of all the, the training courses that have been providing to, to authorities. Um, they've also established partnership with, uh, with um, uh, international government organizations like Interpol or the OECD by funding research, uh, the biggest one of which at the moment is uh, PMI Impact, um, uh, as well as uh, sort of funding research on how to estimate uh, the size of, of illicit trade. And, and that, that those uh, studies tend to uh, overwhelmingly uh, exaggerate uh, the scale of that. They've also been um, uh, influencing uh, media. So, sorry, so PMI impact is what I mentioned. Uh, this is a study done by Alan Gallagher and others that found that tobacco industry funded data, you know, tends to uh, vastly exaggerate the size of the market. markets. Uh, uh, this is what I mentioned um, uh, about uh, cooperation with with Interpol and OECD. For example, you see here the vice chair of an expert group on the anti-illicit trade it is none other that, than uh, the vice president of illicit trade prevention at PMI. Uh, this is a great paper by a former colleague of mine, Julia Smith at SFU, on how um, uh, tobacco companies have been using front groups um, to, uh, to really shape uh, the media discourse on, on the illicit tobacco trade. Um, we've also seen them, of course, uh, directly lobbying uh, government as well and parliament or through those same uh, third parties or, or front groups to decrease taxes, to stop the introduction uh, of, new uh, of new tobacco control measures or remove existing ones. Um, seen that with, with taxation or plain packaging. And of course, all this is happening while mounting evidence uh, suggests that they actually remain complicit in smuggling. Let me just go back for a second here. Uh, this is a project I work on uh, with your University of Bath, with BBC Panorama and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. And one of the most blatant recent examples of, of the sort of uh, uh, strategies that BAT and other big tobacco companies are willing to, to deploy in, in some countries to uh, not only continue to remain complicit in smuggling, while also, um, you know, co-opting law enforcement authorities uh, to not really truly address illicit trade, but to target competitors to disrupt their legal um, manufacturing and distrib uh, distribution uh, processes. Uh, you probably all is also uh, uh, seen an article uh, in the BBC that was related to the project on how. Um, BAT also discussed uh, or negotiated a bribe for Robert Mugabe uh, on an anti-illicit trade issue. So Canada uh, legalized uh, cannabis in October uh, 2018. 
uh, for um, you know number of reasons, including to keep organized crime away from from uh, from the cannabis uh, sector, to protect youth, to protect um, uh, public health. But it, it, the regulatory framework it put in place was largely a, a commercial one, right? Um, and um, three and a half years later, we we've seen kind of concerning developments in some way. We've seen. Uh, BAT, Imperial, Altria, and others uh, investing quite heavily in the cannabis industry in, ca in Canada and elsewhere. Uh, we've seen uh, the Cannabis Council of Canada, which is the, the uh, industry sort of body, uh, heavily uh, lobbying uh, uh, the federal government and, and provincial governments against the introduction of new public health regulations, including on, on limits on THC levels. Uh, or pushing for lowering taxes and increasing enforcement against smaller competitors. Uh, we've seen uh, the former vice chair of the uh, federal government of Canada task force on cannabis utilization regulation now being a chief medical officer at Cannabis Growth. Uh, we've also seen a number of former uh, big tobacco executives now occupying a senior role in cannabis companies in Canada. We've seen uh, cannabis growth and others funding uh, UBC and other academic uh, projects on, on, on cannabis. Uh, while there's mounting evidence that uh, some uh, cannabis companies in Canada have been, you know, some uh, have been complicit in smuggling. Some of them have had their licenses suspended for uh, illegal production. So for not reporting quite a big chunk of their uh, cultivation and production. Uh, this is obviously a, a big issue in, in uh, the US as well, including California and in other uh, states. We've also seen Quite a, quite a lot of vulnerabilities across uh, their uh, supply chain, across legal cannabis supply chain, with um, less than 20% of everything that's been produced legally uh, having, uh, having actually been sold in stores, right? So a lot of it remain in storage and in inventory and so on and so forth, which makes it vulnerable to, to theft or to diversion to the illicit tobacco, to the illicit cannabis trade, to, 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 to the illegal supply chain. All the more so that Canada doesn't have a proper uh, track and trace or seed to sell uh, system that would properly monitor cannabis products all the way from production cultivation to uh, final retail sale. So does it even matter? Yes, it does. Yes, I really do think it does uh, because, well, despite decades of evidence of big tobacco, um, you know, lying about the harms their product cause, about their involvement in smuggling, about how harmful their pr products are. You know, they're still around. They're more profitable than ever. And they've, as I said, uh, used illicit trade as a way to uh, try and rebrand themselves into responsible actors, into uh, trustworthy uh, partners of governments. And, and a lot of um, groups and people and authorities around the world are, are really buying it. And that same playbook looks like it's also being used in, in other industries, including in Canada with cannabis. I should note that cannabis, of course, a lot less harmful uh, than cigarettes, uh, but with all those crossovers and with the role of Canada as a, a sort of global pioneer in cannabis legalization and regulation, you know, we, we need to get this right. Otherwise we risk entrenching, you know, a sort of big tobacco-like industry and, and policies that will likely be detrimental to uh, public health. Um, so this is a, a report I wrote on, the, on some of these topics for uh, uh, the International Drug Policy Consortium. And uh, I really look forward to, to the Q&A. And uh, if you don't have time to uh, ask a question, don't hesitate to, to reach out by uh, email as well. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Benoit. And also that uh, for the collaborative students, that document I believe was sent out ahead of time and we're, we will be sharing uh, resources as well from Benoit. Um, okay, I have plenty of questions and comments, uh, but I, I'm gonna turn it over to Joanna first. Um, Joanna, if you're able to share your slides, please take it away as well. Uh, actually, Dan Daniel, do you mind sharing my slides because we had a last minute change, remember on the... Sure, with the, um, yeah. yes. 
with the name of the seminar. So if you don't mind, I'll just bug you with the. Of course. I added the the title. Just give me yeah. a second. So while you do this, just for the record, I'm this presentation is based on my on my research on my doctoral research and um, and not with my current uh, with my current job. So this everything here reflects my own views as an individual and um, not not on my professional uh, affiliation. So um, is it showing? My, thought, is it showing it properly, or is it my? It's, um, no, you might want to go into like the full screen mode. Like this. Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you. Sure. So um, I have between fifteen and twenty minutes. I'm I'm going to try to um, I'm going to try to keep with the time. Um, I'm going to set an alarm here. Um, and I know that many of you are students. At least Daniel tells me that that's a, it's a mixed audience, and and uh, we have a lot of students. So I thought I would start by introducing uh, introducing this uh, the issue of corporate power and health policy in my framework a bit. A bit my journey to 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 the subject, uh, and then introduce the, the research because I'm I'm not sure people at what stages their research um, students are, but maybe maybe this is helpful so we can so we can move on to the next slide. So a, a bit of, of background. So I, I finished um, medical school in, in 2009, and it was about the time where uh, the social determinants of health, the results of the, the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health were published. And this was, it's one of those publications that kind of, once you read it as a student, it really shapes um, the next steps in your career. And um, we, we're all familiar with, with the, the Metro, the London, the London Tube, and the life expectation, uh, life expectancy. Sorry, in the different in the different stops. This is Michael Marmot's uh, like classic uh, Metro plan, um, and, and and this publication was 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 very interesting because it was was bringing attention to the the social determinants of health. So uh, education, social protection employment, housing, working conditions, and how these, how these factors um, shape population health. Um, next slide, please. So this is, this is the definition. This is uh, the Mar Marmot's definition, the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age. And of course, this drew a lot of um, policymakers' attentions, and very rightfully so, into like these factors. Uh, as I was saying, access to healthcare was one of them, working conditions, labor rights, and so on. Uh, but there was a second part of the definition that didn't really get as much attention. And this was the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. And I always found this very interesting, right? Because we were, we had, amazing research on the effects of housing, uh, labor rights, active labor market programs and mental health and somatic health and so on. But, and, and, and as I said, this is absolutely great, but there was another part of the definition that for some reason didn't resonate as much. And because today's seminar was, is about uh, all these intersections between capitalism and, and commercial determinants of health, I kind of wanted to, um, to, to focus on this, like why, this very, very important part of the commercial determinants of health. So the causes of these causes, the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life didn't really get that much traction. And this was kind of my, this is how I embarked on this journey, like making this shift from uh, this very strong interest in the social determinants of health to the commercial determinants of health. Uh, next slide, please. So as I was uh, embarking on this journey of trying to understand, uh, trying to understand these, this architecture, causal architecture of risk factors in population health, um, I was working as a health advocate in an advocacy group in uh, in in Brussels. So a lot of these, a lot of these tactics uh, that commercial enterprises, that corporations, other commercial actors, were using to shape policy to, to 
try to shape the course of policy policy making in their direction. This was happening in front of my very eyes. Uh, lobbying, revolving doors, uh, even bribing. Um, it was all unfolding in front of my eyes. And I was very aware of, of, of these of these mechanisms. Um, Benoit might know I was working at, uh, at the European Public Health uh, Alliance at the time where the, the health commissioner of the European of the European Union was caught in a scandal with the tobacco industry. Um, bribing uh, was part of it and uh, uh, these revolving doors and everything. So this was this was a very these mechanisms were very real to me. I could see them every day, and at the same time, there was this explosion in the academic literature documenting pathways through which uh, corporations affect uh, the policy making process. But in my head, I knew what the mechanisms were. So this, uh, I mean, I could see it as I say, I could see it every day how some people working in industry then were working at the commission and vice versa. Like this was unfolding in front of my eyes, but I, I wanted some sort of overarching framework that brought together all of this knowledge that we have about how industries operate, how commercial determinants operate. And the 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 one that really hit home for me was this uh, power, a radical view uh, by Stephen Lukes. It's from, it's from 1974. And it kind of gave me the structure to look at, uh, at corporate power and commercial determinants of health in a way that went beyond just documenting the ways in which this uh, influence is exerted. And I have to read this excerpt from the book because I think this is absolutely uh, brilliant. And um, so is it not the supreme and most insidious exercise of power to prevent people from having grievances by shaping their perceptions cognitions and preferences in such a way that they accept their role in the existing order of things. To assume that the absence of grievance equals genuine consensus is simply to rule out the possibility of a false or manipulated consensus. So whereas Luke's didn't, I don't think he set out to write uh, a theory of corporate power, this is a general theory of power. I think this applies um, really, really well to what we see in many of the examples what Benoit just uh, discussed, but in your in the research of many of you present here today, is how did this um, role or how some notions about the role of commercial, deter of commercial players in the way we make policy has become so ingrained that is not, it's not disputed anymore. And I think Benoit just showed how uh, these industry industry people, like very senior industry people are now, it's unquestioned that they will be part of the policy making process, that they will be part of decision making and no one bats an eyelash. This is, this is an accepted, this is a given. Um, so as I was saying, so Luke's helped me shape my thinking around power and in corporate power, but then uh, next slide please. Uh, I also found this theory of corporate power by Doris Fox. It's, 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 it's not a general theory of power, it's, it's a theory of corporate power. Very, 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 very compelling and very useful in structure, structuring my thinking around this. So I combined both of these um, and started looking at, um, I started looking at a, a topology of, of, uh, of corporate power. So uh, next slide, please. This is basically, I mean, this, in fact, this, this slide could, should probably come, come at the end. So um, I basically took Luke's theories, Doris Fox and Doris uh, Fox theories to organize um, the knowledge that had been, that had preceded my own research by, you know, many of you, um, and grouped power into features of power. And we'll get into, we'll get into that. Um, so what are the types of power? power over decision-making, power to define issues, power to avert this conflict. So if, it, if it's not a conflict, it's not perceived as a threat, uh, it's not perceived as an issue, uh, so there will be no discussion around it. So keeping this conflict over, this conflict between health and profit latent. And then the vehicles through which this power is, is, is expressed. So in policy, like, I mean, what I was just telling you my experience in Brussels, preference shaping, narratives, the knowledge environment, Benoit also alluded to that, like research, who pays for it and how it's used. Legal environment, also, uh, it's a nice segue from, from Benoit's um, presentation. 
sometimes the use of illegal tactics and uh, and the extra extra legal environment. Also, we were saying with the case of the health commissioner, like bribing, for example, like, you know, your garden variety illegal activity. And then these tactics, uh, lobbying, civil society capture, uh, science to meet the requirements of your particular industry, and so on. Um, these are these are the actual enablers. These are the actual actions that conduce to the exertion of this power. And all of this, the outcome of the outcomes of this corporate power, um, then shape the macro social the macro social determinants of health. So back to this tension I had in my head as early on in in my career was like, what is shaping the social determinants? What are these structures that are determining the structures and how they determine then risk factors and in population health? In fact, this slide should come uh, at the end because I know that the audience is very interested in politics. So I was just gonna give you uh, a, a kind of a breakdown of these um, of these types of power with, with uh, applications to, um, uh, uh, PPPs. I know that this was the that your audience is interested in public-private partnerships. Um, so um, both Stephen Lukes and Doris Fox they um, they they come up with these um, dimensions of power of types of power, and they're largely in line with each other. So the first one, instrumental power. Uh, or Luke's first dimension of power, it basically boils down, boils down to this. A has power over B because A uses its resources to get B to do something B would not do otherwise. So I want you to approve this legislation. Here's a bit of money. Uh, here is the promise of employment in my company when you leave government. And here's an example of how uh, this power is tied to resources, right? I offer you something, I use something you don't have to make you do something I want to do. Uh, you may have been aware of this. A uh, few. This was uh, in 2018. The U.S. threatened Ecuador uh, with withholding military aid um, when Ecuador proposed a resolution to encourage breastfeeding at the World Health Assembly. Uh, obviously, such a resolution had the power to threaten the the baby milk formula. Uh, in formula industry in in the U.S., so this is this is an example of just a classic uh, um, explicit use of of force. In this case, um, withdrawing military backing to get a desired uh, policy outcome. Uh, except Daniel had mentioned that you were particularly interested in PPPs, so I also thought I would give you an example uh, of COVID uh, and how COVID in the beginning of in the beginning of the of the pandemic. Uh, no one really, no, I mean, we, we all know how prepared we were for this. So there was this, there was this urgency in doing something and oversight went off the window, basically. So did transparency. So there's this, uh, this case from, from the, the UK, the so-called VIP lane, um, whereby uh, the, the government handed out thousands of contracts for services to to, to combat the spread of the, of the virus to a few select companies that had connections uh, with the party and government. Um, so there were 1,200 published central government contracts that were awarded in the first months of the, of the response, the first five months, they were worth $22 billion. Uh, and 5 billion of these went to politically connected companies. So we're talking about companies that had former ministers and, and government advisors on staff. Others were companies of people who had uh, donated to the party and government. And interestingly, some of these companies had a record of tax evasion, of fraud, corruption, and human rights abuses. So but again, this is your... Um, this is your garden variety of the quid pro quo type of corruption um, power exerted in this way. Uh, the second one, uh, Daniel, if you can bring us to the second, the second, it's called structural structural power uh, or Luke's second dimension of power. This one's a bit is it adds a layer of complexity to the first one, and a. And it could be defined in these terms that A has power over B because B depends on A. So uh, B can anticipate A's desires 
A does not have to voice these desires explicitly, and it does not act in any way that could go against A's interests. So here, uh, I'd like you to think of cases of like oh, poor countries or low middle income countries that are heavily dependent on like jobs, on foreign direct investment. And obviously, they know that if there is a regulatory pr proposal that will threaten um, threaten profit, obviously it goes without saying that industry can say, well, I have X amount of job creation. Uh, you make X amount of, 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 of taxes. So uh, the country itself, because of this dependency, will avoid certain regulatory, certain regulatory um, proposals, for example. So in the case, to pick up on the case of Ecuador, um, it's interesting to say that after when this happened, there was an attempt to get other countries to support um, to support the, the, the resolution and countries vo voiced their concerns in supporting and they cited fear of retaliation. So they themselves uh, self-regulate or self, um, what's the word I'm looking for, censored and did not support that. Another example still on the Ecuador example would be that here, the industry or the baby, the, the, the formula industry, there's nothing to suggest or we don't know that there was a direct lobbying of the government to do this at the General Assembly. The government itself knows how important like a, uh, these big multinational formula producing um, companies are and to preempt uh, this regulatory effort without, perhaps, maybe there was, maybe there wasn't, we don't know, but for the purposes of this second dimension of power, the government could be well aware of, of the economic uh, importance of this industry and go and lobby on its behalf unprompted. Uh, but then again, because we know um, that you're interested in, in PPPs, PPPs are a very interesting example because um, they are being promoted by um, international, public international private financial partnerships. Sorry, just to clarify, oh, these are public yes, private yes, partnerships. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I mean public private partnerships and they are being promoted by, uh, by international uh, financial institutions. And in the case of uh, low and middle income countries, this fits nicely with the second dimension of power because these, these financial institutions come with uh, loans so they come with money and they come with technical expertise that often these, these, uh, these governments lack. So um, the country uh, in a sense can, can anticipate the desirability of implementing this, of implementing this uh, public private partnership to deliver care, for example, but it doesn't really have many options. Um, this example I'm giving you here is, a, I mean, it's, in my opinion, it's a, it's, it's, it's quite a blatant one. Um, and it, um, it's from, uh, from Lesotho. Um, and um, so basically what happened, Lesotho is it was a small country and it, uh, the time came to replace its main public hospital. Um, and this was done through a public, partner, public sorry, a PPP uh, in 2009 with technical assistance from the International Finance Corporation. And this is the arm of the World Bank that focuses exclusively in the private sector and in developing countries. Uh, this PPP in, in Lesotho was heralded as a, a model to be replicated, uh, opening a new era of private sector involvement in healthcare in Africa. But what happened was it was quite, uh, was quite the opposite. So essentially, um, Oxfam did a, a review of this, of, this, of this partnership, and they found that um, in one of the most unequal poorest countries in the, in, in the region, uh, this country was locked into an 18 year old an 18 uh, year contract that so this started in 2009 but in 2014 it had already used more than half of the government's health budget so 51% for one hospital um, while providing uh, very high returns of 25% to the private partner now um, the evidence the evidence for this is 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 i mean slim to none uh, on why this PPP should have been there in, in the first place. Um, and by the government's own admission at the beginning of the project, they did not have the capacity to manage and ensure the governance of, of such an arrangement. But the technical advice that they received from the financial institutions is just go, this is, this is, this is the way to go. Um, and what is interesting is that uh, 
this uh, the the World Bank has a has its own unit of uh, independent evaluate an independent evaluation uh, unit that despite all this evidence um, still if you go to their website it's still marketing this PPP as a success an international success to be replicated so evidence does really have has has very little bearing on the nature of the narrative um, here. Um, which which brings which brings us to uh, the third dimension of power, uh, discursive power in Luke's third dimension of power. It's interesting. So I just wanted to say that it's. It, it, I mean, we we shouldn't probably fall into this to this um, uh, to the, this tricky position where we look at these dimensions of power in isolation. They all coexist. And if you look at that first diagram. Uh, all of these tactics are deployed simultaneously, and that's what makes them so so effective. But for me, the one that worries it or keeps me awake at night, it's 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 this this discur discursive power or Luke's third dimension of power. So it's it could be summarized with A has power over B because B has interiorized A's interests as their own, and it does not conceive of a reality where A's interests are not B's own interests. So, in in essence, there is not really. Um, some of the the dogmatism around the role of of uh, the the private sector of the corporate sector is is just taken without a lot of critical a lot of critical thinking and I think COVID gave us a few uh, opportunities to to think about this I chose um, the COVID vaccine to illustrate this point because I found this. Um, very interesting, very interesting paper. So we 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 heard we've been hearing for two years now that uh, vaccines the, about the market prices of vaccines and the the societal value of vaccines and why we should pay and why pharm pharmaceutical companies that produce them are entitled to all of these gains because they provided a, they provided a social benefit they provided a common good. But the interesting thing is uh, when we look at the level of public funding going into the, in this particular example the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine um, in this review uh, by Cross and all they they found um, I want to give you I want to give you the exact figures. So if you bear with me. So they found that public funding accounted for between 97 and 99% of the funding towards the research uh, R&D, the research and development of this vaccine. So uh, these are the facts, but yet all we've heard is that we need to pay for this and they that the that pharmaceutical companies need to recoup their investment. But you know, if, if, we're, if we're gonna take Cross and colleagues, uh, at face value, we'll see that a lot of this was a lot of this was um, was public. But here, the actual the interesting element of discursive power here is uh, is the role that um, private foundations in in this particular case, Bill Gates, uh, had in pushing this agenda. So this is a documented. This is a documented um, a documented process. Um, what happened was that uh, AstraZeneca, uh, Astra, no, excuse me, the University of Oxford, because they had received they had received um, all of this um, all of this funding uh, initially. So I wanted to give you the exact figures on this. If you bear with me for a second, exactly. So, um, so the the vaccine was was developed at oxford university and and in the beginning of the pandemic and this seemed like a gesture of good stewardship of public investment in april 2020 oxford university promised to donate the rights to the coronavirus to any drug maker who would produce it but this was interesting because uh soon after this um Mr. Bill Gates, who was heavily involved in this process, urged Oxford University to sell the exclusive rights of its vaccine to AstraZeneca instead of allowing it to be open sourced. And this has to do with discursive power because a lot of this so-called philanthropic capitalism, uh, a lot of these individuals who have accrued enormous wealth and now shape the direction of public health have a huge bearing on, on the way policy is shaped. And, and they also have a lot of personal beliefs in terms of the role of intellectual property and promoting promoting um, 
research and development. So, so here we have an individual who is incredibly uh, powerful, not least because of how much it donates to global health, uh, who has a belief in intellectual property, actually having a say on how this vaccine that by all accounts was publicly funded will be taken forward and distributed to the population. Um, so, yeah, um, despite, uh, and th this is an interesting part, but perhaps not so, perhaps not so relevant in this case, but then, um, the 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 initial initial the initial uh, promise of like of 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 uh, then producing the vaccine uh, and uh, not 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 making any profits was there but uh, until today we don't know even after Astra, AstraZeneca promised to forgo profits we still don't know how much it costs so this calculation of whether you're making profit or not is um is uh, is is interesting but i guess what i'm trying to say is that crystallizes is this permeation of the of, of the of the discourse or in the policy discourse around intellectual property the role of public funding in developing public goods then is co-opted by this this very very strong narrative around how pharmaceuticals are providing pharmaceutical companies are providing a public good and need to recoup their investment whatever that investment may be um, and just to this just goes a bit to show how these dimensions of power all work together because, for example, uh, the Ombudsman of the European Commission uh, rang alarm bells of how on the lack of transparency of the purchasing power. So the European com the European um, Commission was buying in bulk for the whole of the region, but this negotiation of the prices was never was never um, was never made explicit because there was this there was this prevailing and you you have a lot of these people on the record saying that uh, vaccines must we must pay them we must pay the market price for it. So if even if we were paying fifteen euros a doses, that was very cheap because if the market was left alone to put the price in, we would be paying 100. So the narrative around what constitutes a public good and how much we need to pay for a public good is completely is completely tilted towards this more um, corporate oriented vision. And I know I, I've probably gone uh, above my 15 minutes, so I'll just uh, stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's also on me because I was finding it very interesting. So I, sh I wasn't, I got lost in the time as well. My apologies. And I will note about that. Um, there's a book by Mariana Mazzucato called The Entrepreneurial State Debunking Public Versus Private Sector Myths. That's essentially showing what Joanna is getting at, which is a lot of what we consider the result of, you know, the free market doing its work and et cetera is actually often from public investments in the background that don't get the credit that they should have. Okay, um, so I will open this up to um, the public health policy collaborative specialization <laughs> students. Um, if anyone has a question, I have lots in the background, um, but I will hold off for now. All right, Ingrid. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, both of you, for your talks today. Um, I don't have a question per se. Uh, but just sort of something that was going through my mind as, as you were presenting. I've identified as a social epidemiologist for over a decade, and through the pandemic especially, I felt increasingly pessimistic about, you know, the will, the political will to address the social determinants of health. And the talks today highlight yet another level and potential lever to have an impact to reduce inequalities, but equally they feel uh, like even more accessible for individual action. Um, I wondered if you could speak on sort of the opportunity for positive change where we as individuals, researchers, potentially future policymakers can make an impact to, to address this. So sort of to have a highlight of, you know, an optimistic view to, to the what we're so Ingrid faded out a bit in the end there, but I think that uh, the gist of her uh, question was, was clear. Um, uh, I'm just, do the speakers want to address that question now? Manuel? Uh, yeah, happy to. I'll uh, spend another uh, hour or so going through that. No, uh, I mean, briefly, I, I think, you know, when it comes to tobacco industry and just tobacco trade, you know, there are positive cases 
around the world. And, and, and Robert, I know you contributed to an excellent report from the World Bank on it, really reviewing country lessons around, I forget how many countries there were, there were in terms of you know providing context as to what was happening and, and some of the uh, successes of fa and failures or, or kind of some notes on, on policies that actually uh, proved to be to be useful. We can think of you know tax stamps or some track and trace systems uh, independent from the industry that were put together in, in Kenya, for example, or in Central America that really uh, reduced the, the amount of products that were actually smuggled. Uh, I think in general as well, just contributing to uh, to any sort of you know uh, thorough, comprehensive peer-reviewed research, uh, highlighting and exposing uh, tobacco industry practices and, and strategies. Um, you know, uh, Rob has been part of that. Uh, there's some great people at University of Bath, Simon Fraser University, and, and, and many others, uh, tobacco, econ uh, tobacco economics and in, in, uh, University of Chicago and, and other places that really have shed light on, on some of these things that continue to be underexplored, right? Because tobacco industries have deployed such a multi-pronged, sophisticated strategy uh, to really control everything from the media discourse to uh, research on topic to data to law enforcement to, you know, and we've seen with the pandemic, you know, all sorts of, of PR and, and corporate social responsibility uh, sort of efforts as well to really try and spin the narrative and anything uh, we can do as a community to really highlight some of these practices and, and to keep monitoring them um, is, is incredibly uh important, right? And there, there's some great tools out there, uh, whether it's the FCTC or whether it's to some extent the protocol on the illicit tobacco trade that it provides some good lessons, some good guidelines, uh, um, uh, you know, for, for countries to follow. But very often some of those uh, implementation processes are undermined and co-opted by the industry itself, right? By tobacco companies that, that provide their own track and trace systems or that you know, find ways to get involved, like anything we can do to uh, to uh, inform and to help countries with little sort of institutional capacity to deal with those issues, you know, all the better. I have a, a million of examples from, you know, uh, field trips and research trips in, in Colombia or Panama, for example, with, you know, government officials just being overwhelmed uh, with, uh, with how powerful, uh, those companies are right and so the public health agency really gets it really understands what's happening but if you talk to customs or law enforcement or or fiscalia or other things they're just like no i mean they're helping us we don't have resources so of course we're going to accept their their money and their training and all that so so yeah sorry but long-winded but but there there is there certainly is an opportunity for for positive change so maybe we'll go to the next question or uh, uh, Divya, Joanna, we'll give you a chance to come back and address this question as well uh, in, in, in collaboration with another one. I've, I've got so many thoughts of my own, <laughs> but I'm gonna restrain myself. Go ahead, Divya. Uh, hello, uh, this is a question to both Joanna and Professor Benoit too. It is basically about uh, when we talk about corporate commercial angle and corporate greed, uh, there seems to be sort of this abdication of the responsibility of state uh, and their role in sort of, you know, curtailing uh, these malpractices. Uh, to, just to give an example about the whole controversy with uh, AstraZeneca and uh, Gates Foundation. Uh, Gates Foundation had to step in because there was no country came forward to say that we will bankroll companies to sort of manufacture vaccines uh, in mass scale, which meant that the responsibility fell in the hands of a philanthrop corporate philanthropic organization. So how much do you see there is sort of a uh, critical perspective about the role of state in helping uh, helping cor corporate sort of, you know, have a free run? That was my first question to you, uh, uh, Joanna, and, and uh, to uh, uh, Professor Benoit. Uh, I mean, I've, I've attended your class on illicit trade, but and I think one question which uh, tobacco is such a political issue in most developing countries uh, people politicians lose elections if they don't sort of uh, you know tackle the demands of the tobacco farmers specifically has there been any work done on that about if we sort of move on from uh, from let's say if we really want to address the illicit trade we also have to address that political question and how should we go about that uh, i'm sorry if it sounded like a long question but 
both involves around how the politics and states play their part. Right, I'm going to start here because uh, I would dispute this view that uh, Gates had to intervene because no one. Uh, I don't think that is entirely true. And even if it was, which I don't think it is, um, most countries in their constitutions, in their states of emergency, have provisions to ramp up production capacity within using other different industries or using or using existing capacity to produce something. The fact that states didn't feel that this was a viable political option already shows you the level of permeation of this type of um, the, the inevitability of uh, a private solution to, to common goods. Uh, so I, again, I don't think that this was the case. I think this happened too early in the R&D process, uh, this, this, this Oxford shifting to AstraZeneca. And even if it was, this, this should already tell you a story about how the mechanisms most countries and certainly in Western Europe have constitutional provisions for when there's a state of emergency to rally production capacity for common goods in case of a war, in case of, an, of, of a global pandemic. And this was not made use of. So this should already tell you something uh, about this level of permeation of corporate thinking and that the only solution to common goods and to, and to global public goods is the private sector and it isn't. So I think the answer is there. Yeah, I mean, that's a great answer. Just to follow up on that with an example from cannabis, you know, <clears throat> we cannot expect companies to do good, right? The point of their being is to do well financially, right? So it, it really is the responsibility of, of governments to, to set up regulatory frameworks that work best for the public good. And I think with cannabis legalization, which is a new thing, you know, only three countries so far fully uh, regulated their, their um, uh, entire recreational uh, supply chain, there is an opportunity to, to start with a blank page and to really consider, you know, nonprofit mo models. We've had some uh, nonprofit models for parts of the supply chain, like cannabis social clubs and you know, Belgium and, and, and Spain and other countries, but, but really now we can really, you know, we can establish something new and something that doesn't have the sort of, um, you know, decades of influence of, of industry players in terms of, of, of how to shape it and what's realistic or not. So that's why I really think it's important that, that we sort of act now on, on, on that front, uh, because there's a lot of countries eyeing regulation you know, from Morocco to Luxembourg, Germany, New Zealand, close to home, the US and Mexico as well, right? Um, and on, on your very good question on the political uh, issue, uh, the thing is we have very good guidelines, right? We have the FD, FCTC Article 5.3 uh, guarding against tobacco industry interference. We have NGOs uh, really monitoring all that, uh, monitoring the, the, the myriad of ways that uh, tobacco companies try to influence uh, policy processes. So we have, uh, for example, a tobacco industry uh, interference index Publish annually, so there are lots of ways to 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 get informed in terms of what is happening. Yeah. Of course, at the local level, at times, you know, very often you you get these arguments that, oh well, we if we steer away from from uh, tobacco industry, it's going to cost a lot of jobs and it's going to be very bad for our economy. When academic, you know, analysis very often focus on on the the much uh, larger. Uh, economic and, and public health costs associated with tobacco farming and tobacco and smoking and so on and so forth. So uh, it's certainly been been uh, looked at. Now, I'm not saying it's it's easy in, in any sort of way, right? Because those companies have sort of such huge legal resources and really dwarf um, uh, those of, 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 uh, of many countries, including smaller ones. But, but there are ways around it because there's a lot of know-how. You know, there's a lot of country, uh, um, uh, great academics like Rob and others that have been looking at, at these issues for for a long time and and uh, who really get it right. Uh, but we need to continue to to fund those initiatives, to fund that sort of research, and uh, to hold um, uh, the industry and government officials uh, accountable for that. 
great, great questions and great responses. Uh, I'm just going to give uh, one more opportunity for anybody else from the collaborative specialization to either unmute and ask or comment or to go into the chat. As you're thinking about that, I just want to note that um, most of the attention so far has been on the problem side. Um, you're really uh, uh, laying out the problem, which is super important, and maybe that's what all that can be done at, at this stage. Um, but um, it'd be really interesting to know, you know, how successful have attempts been uh, in terms of changing policy uh, to um, successfully uh, regulate uh, industry. And Ben has been mentioning the FCTC Article 5.3, um, and um, that hasn't been very successful um, uh, 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 overall. And uh, it's it's a very frustrating thing, but. I'm not seeing any of uh, the collaborative specialization uh, students, trainees uh, speaking up. So we're gonna open it up uh, to the entire audience at this point. Oh, there's Dina. Go ahead, Dina. Yes, hi. <clears throat> Thank you all for a great presentation. So I'm just wondering with the uh, relationship we discuss about corporate practices and government practices, uh, that also could impact uh, the public view and confidence about uh, uh, public health policies, like for example, vaccine or mask mandate. So I'm just wondering what would you recommend uh, for uh, a public health employee to do in that case? And what also do you recommend for future students like us to be considered in terms of uh, studying or analyzing future policy? Um, I, I mean, I, I can go ahead. Um, because I mean, I was a student not too long ago and I'm now a, a practitioner. So, uh, and I think these are really, I mean, I think uh, Rob was hinting at that, like, what are the solutions? I think that um, as, a, as a practitioner, um, you really need, I mean, this, I'm sorry if this is really trite, but you really need to question the wisdom that is passed down to you. If you are, uh, say, a policy practitioner in a low and middle income country, and in your area of work, uh, a PPP, a, a public-private partnership is being suggested, then I think my, my advice to you is that you have to engage critically with the evidence, with the pros and cons. I mean, I think that the worst thing that can happen to a public health practitioner and a policymaker is not to question the evidence underpinning a, pos a, a policy solution that is being presented to you, right? So if you were a policy practitioner in Lesotho, when that people when that public-private partnership was proposed, uh, the best way you could have tackled it is in your first preliminary meeting with the donor and with the government, have a set of questions about the fiscal sustainability, like the plan and so on. No one would take you seriously, but it would be on the it would probably be on the on the record of that meeting that you ask these questions about the feasibility, about return on investment, about who's going to pay, about the contract and so on. So the, the, I think the, it's really, a, it's, it's, an, it's an old and tried answer, but you just really need to go prepare to any discussion of a new policy proposal. And then as a student, I mean, it's, it's I mean, again, it's more of the same. I had prepared some figures um, for you because I knew uh, you're interested in PPPs, but for example, even there's some, um, UN uh, work on this. I just wanted to find the the UN did a review um, of these PP. Uh, sorry, one second. I just really wanted yeah a review, a syst uh, systematic literature review that found that papers in favor of public partner partnerships were substantially less likely to document the evidence underpinning their positions than papers against it. Right. And furthermore, there were uh, when conflicts were declared, absence of conflicts of interest was more frequent in critics of PPP than in supporters of PPPs. So I think there is, uh, again, both as a practitioner in which you have to do your homework and go prepared to ask the questions in these meetings where policy is proposed. And then as a student, you have to engage critically with the evidence, which is, I mean, in, in mo uh, I mean, which I'm sure your program prepares you to do, like, you know, be systematic in the way that you look at the evidence. Um, yeah, it's two pieces of advice from this side. 
Thank you. So the floor is completely open for anybody to speak up, comments or questions. Um, and um, maybe while people are, are, are thinking, I, I will pose one of my own. Um, you know, Benoit in particular, you've been speaking about, you know, the role of academics, uh, you know, people like yourself, you've mentioned me a few times. Um, uh, thank you. But, I, I, you know, yeah, I've done a lot of work in this field. And, but, you know, on the policy uh, uh, solution side, uh, has haven't had much effect, actually. Um, and so the, the, the question is really about the policy community. Who is involved with this? So yeah, there's academics like yourselves, um, you know, trying to now a practitioner, Daniel, you know, I know there's, you know, a growing body of scholars who are interested in commercial determinants of health and uh, increasing amounts of research, but who else, right? Because, you know, we're up, we are up against, you know, these huge, powerful corporations. Um, are there, you know, are there, um, advocacy groups um, uh, who are strongly involved are, you know, some of the big charities, you know, work in health, uh, aware of this, willing to engage in it, engaging in it. Um, are there examples, you know, around the world of um, places that have uh, found, um, you know, good solutions and have actually been able to, put, to implement them uh, from a policy perspective? Uh, well, first of all, it, it is, um... Uh, first of all, it, it is very difficult to to measure the impact that your research has, right? Just as it is difficult at times to to evaluate policy and effectiveness. Uh, but you're absolutely right to say that we're, we're certainly incredibly small in terms of our policy influence, as in like academics compared to to um, tobacco industry interests, right? They're a lot more powerful. They have a lot more capacity, a lot more legal resources, a lot more lobbying power. And I think it relates to, to one of the main points I wanted to cover for, for your the previous two questions in terms of, first of all, the need to really build up our public health capacity, just spend more money you know, uh, on public health budgets. Uh, I, I, um, um, Daniel mentioned that I was also a research fellow in the Pandemics and Borders Project and over the past, you know, uh, what a uh, year or so and they have been working on it for another uh, a year we have seen that even in in canada you know the public health agency of canada was just completely overwhelmed you know was not staffed enough sure they hadn't done some of the training and, and pandemic preparedness uh, exercise that they should have been doing but also when you talk to government official federal government officials they're saying you know we've been scrambling we've been in response mode we've been um burnt out, we've been overworked, we're, we're trying our best, but there's just so much to do and so little time for us to be able to take a step back and, and strategize and see, okay, what, what is the literature actually saying? Like, how can we, uh, how can we make sure that our, um, our policies and our, you know, uh, advice to, uh, to decision makers are based on the available evidence, which was obviously fast evolving with a largely unprecedented um, uh, pandemic, and you know, and it relates to the, the question of transparency that we talked about before. You know, if if we don't have the internal capacity to really, if not do the research, at least collect and analyze all the data properly, which which hasn't been done very well, to really um, review and build on available academic evidence, then our policies will likely be vague or and the announcement will not be very detailed, very thorough. And therefore it might lead to some of the things like uh, uh, Dina was talking about in terms of, you know, uh, uh, the industry being able to really affect public views on, on public, uh, on issues like, 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 like COVID-19, right? And in terms of uh, pandemics and borders that has meant that and we have a paper uh, coming out uh, on this topic on frontiers in uh, frontiers in political science, which show that even though the federal government uh, claimed that their uh, policies of the border have been based on, on uh, guided by science and evidence, they never really provided, you know, a detailed um, a set of data or methodology that really showed how they were making decisions, and why they were they were uh, implementing new ones, right? And, and this certainly opens a space for the industry to come in and, and provide their own guidance, their own data, to fund their own research, and also for, for the whole uh, issue to, to be a lot more politicized, right? And 
I mean, we've seen the extreme evidence of that with uh, the extreme consequence of that with the so-called freedom convoy, right, in, in, in the last couple of months. Uh, but just to uh, to touch on your question as well, like what, what can academics do? I think there's some uh, groups that have shown that, it, it, you know, even though rigorous peer-reviewed, comprehensive, systematic academic research is incredibly important, making sure that our papers are not just read by by our mom and dad and and siblings is incredibly is even more important. So, for example, the the stop uh, group is a consortium between your Sir Bath and uh, Vital Strategies in the U.S. and and a few other partners around the world, which really tries to combine um, you know academic research with investigative journalism, journalism and NGO and and so some you know uh, more advanced. Uh, tools for, for to really disseminate all that research and to have people on the ground to 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 talk to people to to advocate for certain actions so i know it, it it makes some people uncomfortable the sort of blurring the line between academia and activism i know some funders <laughs> from previous experience saying like well this is not you know an academic project this is um advocacy and we can't fund that so there's some issues related to that uh but we need to do a lot more in terms of making sure that our, our academic publications actually reach uh, people and spend a lot more time like briefing government officials i know that the academic system is not designed in any way to incentivize that right but we really need to find partnerships that that uh, allow that to to happen Jan, do you want to step in Oh, I, I mean, I think a lot of what I want to get at was what Benoit got to. I also want to just reiterate the point that Dr. Joel Lexton put into the uh, chat, which is that a lot of us, perhaps because of our politics or just our own interests, feel like once we can get the state involved or once we can get public health involved, that that will be the answer. And a lot of the time, these things are happening not to, not um, only despite public health, but in almost in, in partnership with public health, especially, you know, I think um, Joel's talking about the pharmaceutical industry, but otherwise um, it's happening as well, where uh, you have to hold public health or policymakers feet to the fire. It doesn't, it's not just going to be solved because public health gets involved. Often they have the same sort of neoliberal beliefs as, as industry. Um, but I also want to mention, because we're talking about tobacco, there is a well-known tobacco exceptionalism. I mean, it's great that tobacco gets the focus it does, but it's been a much bigger fight to get other areas and other industries um, focused on. And, you know, that's kind of the point of the commercial in terms of health to move beyond uh, just tobacco. But that has been an issue where everyone's willing to agree. Yes, of course, we should regulate tobacco, but, you know, food industry or, you know, farm industry, they're doing that good work. We don't really want to get involved there. So fighting those narratives of tobacco exceptionalism that seem to really uh, help in resisting regulation uh, can be useful. And I, I mean, I, you know, I'll try this when I'm trying to bring up around friends and family regulating pharma, right? You know, there's always this concern, well, what, aren't we going to hurt? And you can, you can, we can be nuanced about it. It doesn't have to be a binary. Uh, so I just want to mention that. I also will say just Erica will introduce uh, the next session. I know we're only running in five minutes. Um, but I just want to make sure I give space to Erica for the very end, Rob. But you are muted, I'm sorry. Yeah, there is a question in the chat from Yuji Cheng. Um, I don't know if either of the speakers uh, would like to address it. How can industry support ethical business practices and positive change in public policy? I mean, I can try and touch on that. It's it's uh, it's a really hard one because it really depends on on what um, what areas you're talking about. I think there's definitely more of an opportunity in cannabis than in tobacco. I don't think there's much to expect from big tobacco companies at this stage, right? After decades of evidence that they're doing very well financially while being uh, uh, unethical and 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 taking part in in illicit and illegal activities. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, there are ways that we've seen in some uh, regulatory frameworks on cannabis to 
to really support sort of social justice causes when it comes to to to, to small cannabis companies. Um, in California, for example, there's some incentives for uh, people that were formerly uh, unfairly targeted by by cannabis prohibition to 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 take part in um, in in the cannabis industry. You know, there are things like that that we can do when it's a new regulatory framework that we can put in place. Uh, but I really wouldn't expect anything at this point from BT or PMI or others. It was really interesting to see in the newspaper, I think yesterday, that in California, uh, according to the newspaper, and anyhow, only only people who had been had a cannabis crime had been convicted uh, uh, would uh, be uh, able to uh, own or run a cannabis shop. Uh, so that that was uh, an interesting twist, I thought. Yeah, I mean, as you said, it's it's a newspaper article. There's certainly a lot of nuance behind that, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's the devil is in the detail very often. Okay, great. Um, oh, one little message there. Yeah, industry is leaving. I mean, yeah, you know, Joel's comment about regulatory capture. Um, I certainly understand that governments, uh, you know, have become neoliberal uh, in their practices and, you know, wanting to um, encourage uh, businesses and not to regulate them uh, tightly. Um, there is also, in my mind, a question, and this is from my older days as a political scientist, of the extent to which governments actually have the expertise. Uh, to develop um, uh, regulatory policies in some of these areas without consulting with industry. And, you know, there's a fine line between consulting and industry being involved in the policymaking process. Um, but one of the challenges that we've faced in government uh, is the capacity to govern. Um, and that has to do with the civil service and uh, what's happened in the civil service, the decimation of the civil service in many countries. Um, the uh, generalization of the public service, uh, such that um, we don't have sufficient expertise within uh, in order to do things. Um, and therefore, you know, the corporations uh, can willingly, because they know better, um, um, you know, pull the hood over the eyes of the regulator. Um, I, I'm seeing Benoit nodding. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I think we, we should remember that also as we think about our government structures. Joanna? Sorry, but on that, there's there's also something interesting here. So I think that, uh, and I've seen it, I, sometimes the government does have the capacity within the civil service, but it bypasses it directly and goes straight to industry. And this has happened. Yeah. Um, and also the government also has uh in 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 governments in countries where they have well established uh, academic communities of national schools of public health governments have been known at least in western europe to bypass those national schools of public health in terms of policy advice and go straight to industry so sometimes the capacity is there but there's a deliberate uh, but then there's something very interesting what you're saying about the civil service and and this is about this curse of power in the narrative right there's also this notion that if you end up working for the civil service at least in many countries in western europe it's because you couldn't do anything else. You couldn't make it in the private sector. And we have to fight this narrative as well, because where did this come from, right? So if 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 you were already creating a narrative on the societal level that uh, you couldn't crack it in the corporate uh, world, and this is why you had no option but to become a public servant, I mean, we're, this is already an uphill battle. So I think we need to fight that. And academia definitely has a role there. We need to fight that narrative because then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Sorry, my two cents on this. Thank you. And thank you uh, to both of our speakers. Uh, thanks to Erica, Quinn, Daniel um, for uh, bringing uh, this really excellent uh, to our students. I see Erica wants to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Really great talks. Um, Daniel had mentioned that I just wanted to say a word about the next session. So if I could just take uh, 20 seconds to do that. Okay. Um, yeah. And so the next session is gonna be um, on April 19th as part of this series. And we're gonna actually focus critically on the food industry and its partnerships and practices. So we have two speakers, my colleague from uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Professor Cecile Knai will be one of the speakers. 
Um, actually, she'll be picking up on some of the themes that um, some of you have already discussed, but with reference to the food industry. And then a recent grad from uh, a PhD program in nutritional sciences, I was on her committee, and she's actually a grad from this collaborative uh, specialization in public health policy, and that's Laura Vergeer, and she's going to actually talk about her dissertation work and, um, well, the lack of effectiveness of voluntary food company commitments in helping to create a healthier Canadian food supply. So that's what's coming up, um, but a special thanks to our speakers. Um, those were terrific talks. Uh, so thanks again. Back to you, Rob. Okay, thank you, Erica. And uh, these seminars, um, it would be, we'd be happy to send the link to them if they're open to our uh, uh, students in public health policy, because I'm sure that uh, many of them would be interested in, in joining that. Uh, this uh, is the last of the rounds in public health policy for this academic year. Um, and um, we will can open up again in September of 2022. Thanks all. Bye-bye.